Welcome and thank you for joining. This video covers Chapter 1 of Think Python by Alan B. Downey. You can check the description for links to a PDF of the textbook, a copy of these slides, and a copy of a notebook to follow along. I encourage you to watch the video once through first to focus on the content, then rewatch while following along in the notebook. In this video, we're going to look at what the Python programming language is, what programming in general is, what debugging is. We're going to look at some of the similarities and differences of formal and natural languages. We'll write our first program, Hello World. We'll talk a little more in detail about debugging. We'll briefly go over the glossary, and then I'll show you how to access the workbook that contains the exercises for the chapter for you to work on. Python is a high-level interpreted programming language, and to add some meaning to that, I'm going to compare low-level languages and high-level languages, and I'm going to compare compiled languages and interpreted languages. Low-level languages are languages like binary, machine code, and assembly. They are uh, dedicated to the hardware that they're written for. So if you write assembly for an ARM chip, which is something you'd find in a cell phone or a tablet, uh, you would have to rewrite that if you want it to run on, say, an x64 Intel chip, which is uh, what you'd find in a laptop, a desktop, or a server. Uh, RISC-V is another version of assembly, which is used very often for embedded applications. Some of the advantages of low-level programs are they process a lot faster, so they require less time to perform the same computation. They're also more efficient, so they uh, require less energy to perform the same computation. And they tend to be a little more stable. Uh, because assembly languages or lower-level languages tend to be much simpler, you have to engineer simpler solutions. And over the long term of running that software, it's going to accumulate fewer errors and therefore be a little more stable. This isn't always true. Of course, things can be poorly engineered, but it tends to be true when you're dealing with a lower level language that it will be more stable. Some of the disadvantages of low level languages are they're less concise, so it takes more code to represent an idea. And as a result of that, they're less readable, so they're, they're harder to interpret. Uh, and of course, we mentioned they are dedicated to the hardware that they're written for. So if you want to change that, you have to rewrite that program. This compares to high-level languages like C, C++, Perl, JavaScript, Java, and of course Python, where they have properties that are more abstract. So they're closer to maybe uh, like a natural language. They're easier to interpret conceptually. And for a great video on abstractness, I recommend the video linked in the slides that goes to a Khan Academy video where Salman Khan explains abstractness very well. So I encourage you to watch that. The advantages of high-level languages are they're more concise, so there's less code to represent an idea. And as a result of that, they're more readable, and of course, they're portable. So you can write uh, you can write a program in C, and you can run that on an ARM chip, or an Intel x64 chip, or a RISC-V chip. Whatever you can compile C into, um, you can move it across that hardware, which makes it portable. This, of course, is also true for um, Perl and JavaScript and Python as well. So any high-level languages, one of the properties they will have is that they are portable. Some of the disadvantages are the processing time and the efficiency. So it's going to take more time and more energy to perform a computation in a high-level language than it will in a low-level language. Next, I want to talk about layers of abstraction. So the lowest layer of abstraction is the CPU, because this is the thing that exists in the material world. CPU is made up of a bunch of transistors, which are uh, something that can either hold a charge or not hold a charge. And we use the bit, which is the fundamental unit of information theory, to represent whether it holds a charge or doesn't hold a charge. By convention, it's a 0 if it has no charge and a 1 if it has a charge. Our next layer of abstraction is machine code. So these are just patterns of binary or hex. Hex is a little easier for a human to interpret because they don't have to remember a bunch of zeros and ones. They can have kind of like shorter, uh, shorter representations of things. Um, but uh, this is kind of why low-level languages are locked into their hardware, right? Um, you have uh, you have assembly, which could use one set of symbols or mnemonics to represent various patterns of hex or binary, and then another CPU manufacturer might use a different set of patterns and symbols to represent uh, the same ideas. So if you wanted to write a program on a new piece of hardware, you'd have to translate that entire program. And this is the big innovation of compiled languages. This is where we start to get portability. You can just write a program in one language like C or Java, and then it would rely on a compiler to translate that down into whatever specific 
uh, assembly machine code, whatever, uh, you know, for whatever specific hardware you want to write that code for. So you have one language and that can translate to multiple different types of hardware, therefore being portable. Now the challenge with compiled languages are you have to you have to compile all of your code at once and then run it and that's when you'll find out when there are errors. So if there's errors early on in your code, you spend a lot of time compiling code that never actually runs and because programmers got a little tired of this, they developed interpreted languages like Python, Julia and R. And the big innovation here is that it's going to compile each line of code one at a time. So if there's a problem, it doesn't waste time compiling the rest of that code. It just breaks where it breaks. And then you have the opportunity to fix that before it proceeds. And as a result, interpreted languages are much easier to iteratively design in. So you do pay a bit of a cost for performance and time, but ultimately you save a lot of that time by not having to wait for a bunch of code that's never going to run to compile. And this brings us to kind of natural languages, but we'll discuss the differences between formal and natural languages in future slides. So this slide is to illustrate some of the difficulty of writing in a low level language. We haven't really used binary since the days of punch cards because it places a lot of limitations in our ability to uh, perform computations. You'd have to understand all of these patterns of holes represented as binary to get the computer to do what you wanted it to do. This is my best attempt at writing a hello world program in binary. Uh, this probably won't run on anything, but it's more or less to just illustrate how, uh, how difficult it would be to keep track of all these patterns of zeros and ones to do something like simply printing out hello world to the terminal. Machine code makes it a little easier because we can use hex, so we have uh, kind of more symbols to represent things in a shorter uh, in fewer characters. And then we have comments to kind of keep track of what each of those lines do. But you can see the trend of conciseness and readability from binary to machine code, and then from machine code to assembly, where in assembly, we're starting to see a semblance of an actual language. We have words like global and push and call and add. Um, so we're definitely moving towards the readability aspect of it. And then we get into the higher level languages like C, again, much, much more concise, much more readable, but nothing compared to Python. Python is literally just print hello world. You got a little bit of syntax here with the parentheses and the, uh, the single quotes here, but this is why Python is such a great language to learn. It's still very powerful, but it's also very approachable, readable, and concise. So I already kind of touched on the difference between compiled and interpreted languages. Interpreted languages allow you to sacrifice some performance and efficiency uh, to save a lot of time in waiting for code to be compiled. But I want to give you a more specific definition of each of these here. So compiled languages translate all the source code into object code at the same time and then it's run by a hardware executor. Interpreted languages process the program a little at a time, alternately reading lines and performing computations. A program is a sequence of instructions that specifies how to perform a computation. This could be mathematical or symbolic computation, but in either case, it comes down to the basic functions of input, output, math, conditional execution, which we model with if statements, and repetition, which we model with loops. Computation is the process of breaking a large, complex task into smaller subtasks until those subtasks are simple enough to be performed with a mix of these basic instructions. This can also be thought of as formalized critical thinking. If you want to watch a really interesting and informative video on computer science, I recommend checking out the Art of the Problem video linked in the slides. Programming is very error prone, and this could be from your day to day typos that everyone makes all the way up to very complex and challenging semantic errors. Programming errors are called bugs and the process of tracking them down is called debugging. There are three kinds of errors you'll run into syntax, runtime and semantic, and it's useful to distinguish between them in order to track them down more quickly. Syntax refers to the structure of a program and the rules about that structure. If there's a single syntax error in your program, Python will display an error message and quit running that code, and you won't be able to run that program successfully until you fix all of the syntax errors. As you gain experience, it will feel more like spell check, you'll make fewer errors and find them faster. Runtime errors are errors that don't appear until after the program has started running. These are also called exceptions. Runtime errors are rare in the simple programs that you'll see in the early chapters, so you'll encounter them in greater detail in later chapters. 
Semantic errors won't necessarily generate any error messages, but it's going to do what you told it to do rather than what you wanted it to do. So the meaning of the program or its semantics are incorrect. They can be very tricky to debug and they require you to work backwards by looking at the output of the program and trying to figure out what it is doing. One of the most important skills you'll acquire is debugging. It can be very frustrating, but also intellectually rich, challenging, and interesting. It's very similar to detective work. You must use clues and infer the process and events that led to the results. It can also feel very similar to experimental science, where you're iteratively modifying your program and you try until the errors are resolved. You form hypotheses until the outcomes match your prediction. I now want to discuss some of the similarities and differences of formal and natural languages. Natural languages are languages that people speak, such as English, Spanish, and French. They're not designed by people, although people do try to impose some order on them, but they evolve naturally. Formal languages are designed by people for specific applications, so this could be like math notation or chemistry notation. And programming languages are formal languages that have been designed to express computations. They have very strict rules about syntax. Syntax rules come into flavors, tokens, which are the basic elements of the language, such as words, numbers, and chemical elements, and the structure, and this is more concerned with the arrangement of the tokens. A natural language sentence or a formal language statement has a structure that must be interpreted, and this is what we call parsing. And formal and natural languages have many features in common, such as tokens, structure, syntax, and semantics, but there are some differences. Natural languages have a lot of ambiguity. They rely on context, clues, and other information to parse, whereas formal languages are designed to be unambiguous. Each statement has exactly one meaning. Natural languages are very redundant to deal with ambiguity and reduce misunderstandings, but formal languages are less redundant and more concise. Natural languages have idioms and metaphors, so they're not very literal, but formal languages mean exactly what they say. If you want to watch a useful video by Allison Kaptur on how to approach reading code, I recommend the video linked in the slides. Hello World is typically the first program you write in a new language. In Python 2, it looks like this, where we have print, a space, and then the string Hello World. This is an example of a print statement, and it displays a value on the screen or in the terminal. Quotation marks in the program mark the beginning and the end of the text to be displayed, but they don't appear in the result. In Python 3, the syntax for printing is slightly different, where we use print as a function, and we have parentheses that we pass an argument to. In this case, our string hello world, again defined by our quotation marks at the beginning and the end of the string. So I'm going to hop over to the Colab notebook, so you can find a link to this in the description below. And the way this is set up is for you to be able to take notes for each section as you read through the PDF after watching the video. But I'm going to focus on the I'm going to focus on the code block here. So the convention that I use is this comment here is going to match the place in the textbook. So you can see this is section 1.5. And you can see that this text matches here. And we have our code here. So you can copy this and go back to the notebook and paste this in. And now you can run this. Something I want to caution you of here is uh, Colab is using Python 3. If we try to use Python 2 syntax in that, it's going to give us a problem. So let's take a look at what that problem will be. So we'll run this. You can see we don't have our parentheses here. And we get a syntax error missing parentheses in call to print. Did you mean print hello world? So in this case, we can just copy this here and paste this in. Now the print isn't the only difference between Python 2 and Python 3. But as you go through, if you if you see errors like this, uh, it's worth googling them and just checking out uh, what that error might mean. And if it's something where you're trying to use Python 2 syntax and a Python 3 interpreter. It's pretty well documented, so it's going to be easy for you to find out that that's the problem. And it's great practice for you to experience some errors. So don't let that uh, challenge or discourage you. Uh, just know that it's a very common thing to have to deal with uh, different conventions between different versions of languages. I encourage you to rewatch this video while having the notebook up so you can pause and try variations in your code. You can find the link to the master copy in the description. So to make your own copy, you'll go to the upper left-hand corner. You'll select File, Save a Copy, and Drive, and this will open a new copy in your Google Drive. And this allows you to experiment and make mistakes, see what happens if you remove tokens from your code, and so you get exposure to the resulting errors. 
So to demonstrate that real quick, upper left hand corner by the gold collab logo, you'll click on file and then just just past a third of the way down, you'll select save a copy and drive. It'll say creating a copy and it'll open a new copy in a new tab. So this is your copy of this notebook. So you can go through and add whatever notes from reading the PDF. Uh, and of course you have uh, the code block for writing your own code for Hello World. And then you have these debugging challenges here. So all of these lines of code are broken and it'll be up to you to go back through with what you've learned from the chapter and fix them. Following along will help reinforce what you've learned and help you understand what different errors mean. It's better to make mistakes now on purpose than later and accidentally. Debugging can bring out strong emotions like frustration and embarrassment, and if these are not dealt with properly, it can lead to anger and even depression. This is especially true if you're under the pressure of a deadline or time-sensitive troubleshooting. Exposing yourself to errors voluntarily under circumstances that are not stressful will help you keep calm and think clearly in more stressful situations. I encourage you to manually copy the glossary into your notebook. This will help with retention and give a good overview of the chapter and its contents. So this is where you will manually copy the chapter's glossary. And you will find the glossary in section 1.7 of the textbook. And this brings us to the chapter exercises and the finger exercises. Uh, you can find links to both of those notebooks here, as well as a link to Alan B. Downey's GitHub for attribution and licensing of ThinkPython. In the textbook, you'll find the exercises under section 1.8. You'll also notice that it starts on exercise 1.2. 1.1 is found a little earlier in the chapter, but I've compiled all of these into that workbook so you can provide your answer for each exercise. So for exercise 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3, you have all the information you need to attempt those exercises. And then 1.4, you have a code block where you're actually going to write some code. And then you have finger exercises. This is just something I've added on because I think to get in a daily habit of programming, it's nice to start by creating some code. So this asks you to create three unique finger exercises related to the skills covered in the chapter. And they may be variations of the code found in the chapter. The benefit of this is as you continue to follow along with each of these videos for each chapter, you're going to build up a repository of finger exercises that you can revisit daily to just manually copy. And that's what's going to get you in the habit of typing out code and getting more comfortable doing that. So thank you for joining and I will see you in the next video.